low back pain, as you know, is ubiquitous. Everybody has it at some point in time. And one of the difficulties with it is that, and also the fact that the severity and chronicity of the pain doesn't necessarily correlate with what might be underlying and what the problem may be. So it's not always so obvious when to refer somebody. It's not just as simple as bad pain, go to emergency room, not so bad, don't. Cotoquina is urgent, metastatic disease is not quite as urgent necessarily, but it's obviously something that you don't want to miss. And as a general rule, when somebody with back pain, when I'm talking to students or anybody else about it, you always have to ask about bowel function, bladder function. And if you have any concerns about it, you need to do a, do a rectal exam. The other thing with Cotoquina syndrome, which lots of people are aware of those things about it, the other red flag that sometimes isn't flagged up, for want of a better term, is bilateral sciatica. So somebody with sciatic symptoms that affects both sides, it probably means that a disc is big enough to affect nerves on both sides. So again, it may affect the nerves in between the ones in the bowel and bladder. So that's the primary indication referring somebody to the emergency room. It can be a little bit difficult because patients are often anxious to be treated as expeditiously as possible and they're often keen to be referred onwards quickly and the emergency room is sometimes the best way to access specialist services. Um, and sometimes people will make more or less of symptoms than they are. But if you're somebody who you think is called Aquinas syndrome, it's behoven to refer them onto the emergency room. And in our practice, and we would see most of it in the country in the matter, um, it's, people are referred appropriately very often, for better or for worse. I often see or often provide reports about people who are not managed appropriately. It's seldom in general practice where that happens, it's more when they get to the emergency room. Um, and it's quite interesting to me how powerful the referral and, and being aware of those symptoms are in terms of sending somebody you know, as quickly as possible. The other condition that you really don't want to miss is metastatic disease. Um, and again, there's some, some you know, well-known red flags which indicate to somebody whether or not they may be at risk of something like that. The simplest and most obvious one is history of cancer. It's terrible for us, the frequency with which we see somebody who is had particularly something like breast cancer years and years ago and everything seemed to be fine and they present late with, with back pain. Um, histories of prostate cancer is also a very common thing and prostate cancer typically metastasizes to the spine. Apart from history of cancer, pain that's not going away. Most back pain will get better on its own accord. If it's not, it's a red flag and you worry about it. Pain that's not necessarily activity related, so it's worse when I go to bed at night. It's stopping me sleeping. That's a big red flag and you get concerned about it anybody with systemic symptoms. Nobody loses weight without trying to. If you are, it might seem like good news, but it usually isn't. And then the two big problems, big things that you need to, need to think about referring on. The other thing that we're seeing a little bit more often now are spinal infections, and um, for a variety of reasons, they present like tumors. And the red flags are the same, and the investigations are the same, and the treatment are the same. And particularly with people coming to Ireland from other areas, although actually not exclusively those, also with you know, in, indigenous native Irish people, things like tuberculosis are becoming more common. Um, but again, they present in a similar fashion. But they're the two big groups of condition which really mandate urgent referral to the emergency room. MRI scanning the spine is, is, is a kind of a difficult area because lots of patients expect it as part of the routine treatment. I suppose in general practice, it's a bit like the person with a cough or a cold who expects antibiotics. MRI scanning of the spine is not always indicated and it's not always very helpful. And what we know about spinal imaging, particularly MRI scanning, is that it's very sensitive, but it's not very specific. It is very rare to see a normal MRI scan of the spine. And it's kind of useful to remember that because when you are referring somebody for an MRI scan of the spine, you can often say that to them in advance. So that when the report comes back suggesting disc bulges and degenerate change and all kinds of things which can sound very dramatic to a patient, if you've preempted it a little bit, it can kind of avoid people having significant problems. In general, the best indication for us for an MRI is when you think somebody has got compression, got nerve compression of some variety. So somebody with sciatica that's not resolving. Most sciatica will resolve, and it's only presents with a short history. It's perfectly reasonable to say, I think you have a disc herniation, I think you have got sciatica. There is a 70 to 80% chance that in two to four weeks it'll get better. If it doesn't, we do a scan. It always strikes me as a very straightforward way of dealing with that problem for a patient. Um, if you've got somebody with significant red flag type symptoms, one of which can be symptoms that, that, that last for longer than you might expect, that can often be a good reason for an MRI scan. Often from a clinician's perspective, you're doing it to reassure somebody. And again, it's good to preempt that. You know, warn somebody that I'm looking for X, Y, or Z. 
you may not want to tell them that you're looking for something like a spinal met if that's what you're worried about and um, which you can alert them to the fact that you're looking for certain significant conditions but that you expect degenerate conditions or wear and tear so they're not concerned. It's a good, it's good habit and good practice I think before ordering an MRI scan to, and it sounds like a medical student type thing but to decide what you expect to see. And if the MRI confirms your clinical suspicion, that's a valuable test. If the MRI un uncovers something that you didn't expect, you question whether or not it's terribly relevant. It's actually very well uh, recognized that MRI findings don't necessarily correlate with clinical syndromes. In fact, they correlate weakly with them. So you need to be a little bit cautious. But you know, the reality of, of practice as it is now is patients often expect certain treatments um, and sometimes it's not so much whether to do the scan as to, uh, as to kind of get people ready for how you're going to interpret it, when it when, once it's done. I'm, I'm a traditionally taught and trained orthopedic surgeon and I'm very involved in teaching and 99 times out of 100 I'll suggest plain films before advanced imaging such as MRI scan. Probably the one area where that's not necessarily the case is in the low back. The number of significant conditions that are shown by a plain x-ray that not, but not by an MRI scan are relatively slight. If you think somebody's got a fracture, certainly a scan can be, can be useful, but that's often not the case in the general practice setting. Even if you think somebody may have an osteoporotic fracture, which may present, often an MRI scan is more useful because it'll tell you how acute or otherwise any changes are. Degenerate changes are much more obvious on MRI scanning and MRI scannings are, scans are functional in that they can show you if there's active ongoing edema at the time. Me personally, I'll often ask for a plain x-ray after an MRI scan is done for surgical planning. So that's probably something that's not as relevant in general practice. Perhaps the one place where it might be more relevant is in the adolescent patient where the types of condition they can have are slightly different. So, Classically, young people presenting with back pain are worried about things like spondylolisthesis or stress fractures in their lumbar spine. And there can be a role for plain x-rays in that situation. But in truth, a well-conducted MRI scan gives as much and more information. So it's probably more worthwhile. Currently, it's not that much more expensive to get an MRI scan. And it's not that much more difficult given the number of scanners available. So time when it's, re when it's relevant to get a plain x-ray is actually much less than it would be for mm -hmm. lots of other orthopedic conditions. Obviously the critical and emergent conditions are one group of things that we've, which we've spoken about. On the more elective setting, the types of things that orthopedic or neurosurgeons can helpful, be helpful with uh, break down to several different types of conditions. So there are operative procedures that we can do which are predictably successful uh, and that are relatively low risk for which the rehabilitation is relatively modest. There are other conditions which are much less predictable where the risk of complications is higher and the rehabilitation consequences are different. So the types of conditions that we treat are very different. In general, the vast majority of spinal conditions are self-limiting. So an initial trial of non-operative management is optimal, nearly always. Um, very frequently I'll see somebody who has got severe sciatica, for example. Short duration, presents to a general practitioner who diagnoses clinically a herniated disc and refers them urgently to me. I'll see them a week or two later, symptoms are 80% better. So very often an initial trial of non-operative management is appropriate. If the symptoms are failing to settle, particularly symptoms of leg pain, um, be it from disc herniation with acute sciatica or something like st spinal stenosis in older patients who've got significant functional limitations or neck problems which can present similarly arm pain with the cervical nerve root irritation or cervical stenosis. Uh, after they've been, been seen initially then there is a role for a, a predictable role for surgery and it's probably more beneficial to think of referring those kind of patients. Sometimes Patients are looking for reassurance and whether I'm right or wrong, it has often occurred to me that it's much easier for me to say to somebody, you don't need an operation because I can do the operation than it is for somebody who's not doing it. Patients maybe not unreasonably say, well, you're not going to do it anyway, how can you tell? So while sometimes we wonder about referrals and why they're said, you know, 
that's not an unreasonable reason to send somebody along. Um, but again, like I've said with scanning, if you set people up in the right way, and first of all, say, look, I don't think you need an operation, but we can ask a surgeon. It makes things an awful lot easier in actual fact. But really the main reasons, sciatica, spinal stenosis, they're very good reasons to send somebody to an orthopedic surgeon. Back pain is, axial type back pain is a whole different range of problems with different range of treatments and it's much more complex and often it's more in the case of being referred for an opinion as to what can or cannot be done but generally speaking surgery has much less of a role for those kind of conditions. Spinal stenosis is a surprisingly common condition which is often overlooked because it tends to happen in older patients. And essentially what spinal stenosis is, it is a problem whereby spinal joints become arthritic, they become swollen, and they reduce the space available for the spinal cord and the nerves. The classic symptoms that people will present with is pain or heaviness or deadness in their legs brought on by walking and relieved by rest. So classic intermittent claudication. As medical students, we're often taught that claudication is primarily due to vascular disease, but the other problem that can cause it very commonly is spinal stenosis. What differentiates vascular claudication from spinal claudication largely boils down to risk factors for vascular disease. So patients who have got significant risk factors maybe have abnormal vascular findings. You first assume that it's, because it's caused by a vascular condition. Spinal stenosis causing claudication can, but isn't always associated with back pain. Um, it can be associated with, with subtly abnormal neurological findings like diminished reflexes in the lower limbs, but actually that's very common in the general population. So it's not a terribly good discerning feature. The real thing about spinal stenosis that distinguishes it is the pattern of exacerbation and relief of the symptoms. So classically people with spinal stenosis will describe pain brought on by walking, but relieved by sitting rather than just stopping and standing. The reason for that is that we know that when you flex your spine, which is most easily done by sitting down or bending forward, you increase your spinal dimensions and the pain gets better. And it often strikes me as surprising how almost pathognomonic that sign is. So leg pain brought on by walking and relieved by sitting. The other classic feature, which again, you would think is unusual, but I see really very often is what we call from the American literature, the grocery cart sign. So patients that say if they can walk leaning over a shopping trolley or leaning over a baby's buggy better than they can when they can't is a classic feature of spinal stenosis. They're great grandparents to have because they'll bring your kids for a walk whenever you like. Um, one of the reasons why it's an important thing to, do, to, to try and pick up is because there is often a temptation when you have somebody who's getting on in years and is becoming less mobile to put it down to advancing age and to not do anything much about it. But surgical management for spinal stenosis is very successful. It's as good at restoring quality of life as hip replacement. So lots of people will get tremendous relief with spinal decompression. So in somebody with spinal stenosis who suspect you of those symptoms, it can be easily confirmed with MRI scanning. There's definitely a value to referring to them for orthopedic surgery. Very frequently I will have patients saying to me, butcher, I'm too old for a back operation. I'm not an aggressive surgeon. I don't put, push people down the road of having surgery, but those people will often get very good improvement in their quality of life with spinal surgery. So the role for clinic examination in the back is actually relatively limited. When looking at the spine itself, people often focus on, on movement patterns within the spine, but there's not an awful lot of very useful features in movement. Without wishing to be cynical about it, the kind of ooh and ah and abnormal movements more likely represent functional pathology than anything else. So that's often the main use for looking at movement of the spine. What is very useful is to try and address the presence or absence of spinal deformity. And that often sounds like a very complicated thing, but it isn't really. Essentially, in terms of balance, what your spine is doing is putting your head above your pelvis. And if you have difficulty standing straight with your head above your pelvis, that can indicate a spinal deformity, which can be very disabling. And the best way to assess it really is just to look at somebody from the back and see if their occiput lies over their natal cleft between the cheeks of their butt. That means in the coronal plane, looking from the front, they're balanced. More importantly is looking at somebody from the side. If your ear 
is over your greater trochanter. When your knees are straight, your spine is balanced. If it's not, if you've osteoporosis and you've kyphosis and you're tending to lean forward, that's a very difficult way to ambulate, way to stand in terms of energy consumption and it's a very disabling thing. So looking at the spine simply, is your head above your pelvis is an important thing. When examining the lower limbs, um, the real thing you're looking for are signs of nerve root irritation. And generally speaking, by far the most common nerve roots that are irritated with things like disc herniations are the S1 nerve root and the L5 nerve root. If the S1 nerve root is dysfunctional, from a clinical perspective, you may get weakness of your ankle plantar flexor, so toe off becomes difficult. And the easiest way to assess that is to get somebody to walk on their toes. And if somebody has difficulty getting up on their toes, it may represent subtle weakness of their plantar, ankle plantar flexors. The other simple way to assess it is to get somebody to stand on one leg, rest their hands on a table, lift one foot and go up and down on the heel. One, and, and they say measure for 10 times. So just do it on the good leg, do it on the bad leg. And sometimes you'll say, oh, I'm a little bit weak, I didn't expect it. It's quite a sensitive sign. The other thing you'll get with somebody who's got an S1 nerve root problem is an absent ankle jerk. And again, when we're learning as medical students, sometimes we don't put as much store on as you might. It's actually very sensitive. So if you want to look clever in somebody with sciatica and you find a subtle weakness and absent an ankle jerk, you can tell them you've got an L5, S1, nerve root, and S1 radiculopathy, almost certainly. The other thing with sciatica to check for is straight leg raising positive, is looking for nerve root irritation. For me, the easiest way to do that is with a patient sitting on the table with their knees, or, or on an examination couch, with their knees flexed, and you just lift one leg up. Lying somebody flat and lifting the leg will always reproduce symptoms. A, a, an almost pathognomonic sign is crossed straight leg raising. So if somebody comes to you with what sounds like sciatica in the right leg, and you do straight leg raising on the left hand side, and it reproduces right leg pain, almost certainly they have a disc herniation. Very sensitive sign. An L5 nerve, nerve root problem will cause predominantly weakness of your ankle dorsiflexors. Again, the simple way to test that get somebody to walk on their heels. It seems a little bit daft, but some people can find a little bit of subtle weakness, which can be signs of something like an early foot drop. Foot drop can be quite disabling, so to pick it up early is useful. And really they're the simple signs when you're examining somebody's lower limbs. There's not very much more than that. We'll often, I will often, I will always check somebody's hips and their knees because they can have coexisting problems. And then there are other signs we've spoken about for things like caudal quina syndrome, if you feel it's appropriate to do rectal examination. But I say the lower limb exam from a spinal perspective, actually relatively straightforward and it can yield some good information. So generally speaking, leg pain is caused by disc herniation and sometimes with an element of narrowing of the bony canal where the nerve comes out. So that may be because of bony swelling from the disc space or bony swelling from the joint itself. And essentially what the surgery involves is decompressing the nerve. The reasons you do the surgery as I often say to patients are, pain I can't put up with it for another minute, or pain that's been going, going on for so long it's becoming a pain in the ass, basically. So duration of symptoms and severity of symptoms. Very often leg pain from any of those conditions will resolve with time alone, with conservative management, with gentle mobilization, with simple anti-inflammatories. But if it doesn't, if it's so severe it's interfering with quality of life, or it's not settling in an appropriate amount of time, then surgery is a role to play. Sometimes it's appropriate to consider injections, an injection of local anesthetic and steroid around an inflamed nerve to reduce the inflammation and really I think to reduce the symptoms while the natural history is taking course. If you proceed to surgery, as I said, the, the essential element is to decompress the nerve. That can involve simply removing the disc if there's a soft disc fragment or it can involve removing small amounts of bone to increase the space available for the nerve. But the critical element is to, is, is to decompress the nerve itself. Most patients who have that kind of procedure will get very good instantaneous pain relief. So what we like is people who wake up from their surgery saying my pain is gone. And surprisingly often you get that. Depending on exactly what you've done, most people are asked to take it easy for about six weeks because there is a risk of re-herniation of disc for the first six weeks or so. And after that resume normal activities and get back to doing everything over the course of three or four months. Manual, work, sport, that kind of time frame. And 
sometimes these surgeries are, are involve removing more bone than you might expect and it may lead to instability. If you take enough bone or enough of a joint away, your spine can become unstable. In that circumstance, sometimes you'll choose to fuse or stabilize the spine. Nowadays, traditionally, we'll do it with instrumentation and with bone graft, um, but that's the main indication for an instrumented fusion. Fusion surgery works better when it's done as an adjunct to spinal decompression surgery.